Okay. <clears throat> and it's now time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Um, I call Ms Sandra Overend. Question number one, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We remain committed to ensuring that victims and survivors receive the best services possible, and the Victims and Survivors Service continues to be our frontline delivery body for provision of these services. £14 million has been allocated in this financial year to victims and survivors, the highest ever opening budget for the sector. Victims and survivors groups who meet the criteria can also apply for funding from our Departmental <coughs> Central Good Relations Fund. The Peace 4 Cooperational Programme for 2014-2020 has recently been launched and it also includes for victims and survivors the sum of €17.6 million. Euros. This is anticipated to open for application in autumn 2016. And I call supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for that detail. Uh, I'm sure that the First Minister will know the figures. I'm sure uh, of 10 per cent of all the people who lost their lives in the Troubles were from Mid Ulster, but yet uh, much less than 10 per cent of the support funding for victims and survivors is allocated to my constituency. I wonder, is the, is the First Minister willing to look at this anomaly and attempt to address it? I do thank the member for her question. I suppose one of the concerns we've had uh, over the years is the fact that unless uh, victims had been affiliated to victims' groups and that they could not access uh, the funding, and actually one of the ways we're trying to deal with that is through the individual uh, pilots that we've been running to see if there are ways that we can reach those people, and that continues to be the case, uh, that we are continuing to reach out to people who otherwise perhaps wouldn't have access uh, to the funding. And we understand that it's not necessary uh, for victims and survivors to be uh, involved with victims groups. Some people do not want to become involved in that way, and that's perfectly uh, a reasonable situation. But it's how we reach those people. I think we are making strides to reach out to those people. Uh, and of course, we will uh, take any suggestions as to how we can reach those people in the office, and we will consider those suggestions. And if the member has any particular suggestions, we would welcome those as well. You, and, uh, before I call Mr Michael Veen uh, to, to ask a supplementary question, as the Minister's Assembly Private Secretary, uh, and in line with the protocol, I remain the member that the question should relate specifically to a constituency matter in which you are directly involved. Mr David Michael Veen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I wish to ask the First Minister to welcome, obviously, the uh, money that has been allocated from Peace 4. Um, I just want to check with the First Minister what amount of this would be allocated towards trauma services, and uh, could she perhaps update the House on, on that information? Um, well, Mr. McElveen is not my APS, but uh, in any event, um, he was when I was in finance, uh, so maybe that's the issue. Um, the department has been exploring opportunities to utilise Peace 4 funding to try and take forward uh, elements uh, of the trauma-related services. He'll be aware uh, that my colleague, the Health Minister, has made uh, announcements in relation <coughs> to mental health services recently in a general sense, and I very much welcome that. Uh, but we have been working uh, through the Peace 4 uh, steering group to try and make sure that we have access to monies uh, in terms of trauma-related services as well, and we'll be taking those issues forward. Uh, the Victims and Survivors Service will take those issues forward on our behalf, and uh, it, there is 17.6 million euros uh, in that victim sector, including the match funding, and we want to make sure that we draw it down and we use it in the most uh, productive way possible. And I owe you an apology, Mr. McElveen, but can I congratulate you on a magnificent recovery? <laughs> And it comes with Jared Devon. Speaker, um, can I ask the First Minister, do you agree that the £150 million identified at Drummond House is actually inadequate to deal with the issues of victims and survivors, given the £30 million alone that's uh, uh, mooted for stake life and the new work by the Lord Chief Justice on inquests, that there's actually a need for a major uplift on the monies required for this issue? Well, as the member is probably aware, uh, at the moment we don't have access uh, to that £150 million uh, because 
uh, there was a lack of agreement in relation to dealing with the past. I am on record uh, as calling on the Secretary of State to release that money so that we can free up uh, uh, the resources that have been needed, not uh, least by the Lord Chief Justice uh, and indeed by the Police Service of Northern Ireland. I was rather alarmed to hear recently that the uh, Chief Constable had been indicating that most of his budget for dealing with the past was being uh, if you like, seconded uh, to the DPP, to issues that have been raised by the DPP. Um, so those are issues uh, that continue uh, to be very much to the fore of my mind. And again, I would reiterate that I do believe the Secretary of State needs to look at this very carefully. She has made uh, some noises recently, which I take as being positive, to allow some of that money to be released. Uh, I would encourage her to do that uh, so that we can deal with those elements, because despite the fact that we have no agreement on the past, there are is those issues that still remain and still have to be dealt with, uh, and I would call upon her to release that money. And I call Mr. Alec Mask. Number two, Kesar Bradal, Idaho. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Pingali to answer this question. One of the headline actions of the Together Building a United Community strategy was to pilot 100 summer camps in 2015. I am pleased to say that this target was achieved with 101 camps operating on a local and regional level. Summer camps are about building positive relations between young people aged 11 to 19 on a cross-community basis. They represent an investment of in and around £1.2 million by the Northern Ireland Executive and approximately 4,200 young people participated in 2015. A reunion event was held on Saturday the 13th of February in W5 in the SSE Arena. Junior Minister McCann and I attended and were pleased to announce the launch of the substantive summer camps programme in 2016-2017. And call Mr. Maskey for... uh, can I thank the Minister and the Junior Minister for that response? Could I ask the Junior Minister would she have, even at this stage, any further information around the uh, follow-on community relations activities in respect of the Lake of West Belfast, my own constituency? Maybe a bit early to have a drill down information on that. Uh, yes, uh, we have been carrying out a very detailed uh, evaluation of the pilot, and that included a number of uh, officials visiting um, a number of the summer camps to see what was happening on the ground, get some feedback from that. We have held a number of stakeholder events as well from those who participated, not just the organisers, but very much the young people themselves. Uh, we will be rolling this out um, with some small amendment uh, to the programme criteria for 2016-2017 and we, you know, we are confident at this stage that the co-design that we have for the project is the correct one but, but we remain um, flexible on this so we will continue to listen to feedback on that and make whatever necessary changes uh, that, that, that are needed. Thank you Mr Speaker. In a written statement uh, on the 3rd of March the First Minister uh, said that continued progress uh, is being made on the projects funded by the UK Government, Northern Ireland Executive, building a united community economic pact, and that includes integrated primary schools. Can I ask the, the junior minister which integrated primary schools projects uh, have been supported by the economic pact and by how much? Well, I'm happy to write to the member in terms of the specifics of his question, but I can assure him that in terms of our shared uh, education agenda, integrated education is very much at the centre of that. Not only that, but in relation to, for example, the shared education project initiative that we are funding in OFMDFM along with Atlantic Philanthropies, um, all schools, including many integrated primary schools and post-primary integrated schools, are also involved. So I am happy to write with, uh, to him on the very specific detail of his very specific question, but I can assure him that absolutely they are included, money is being rolled out, and we are getting very, very positive feedback in terms of our Together United Building United Community uh, agenda. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister what progress has been made on the evaluation of the Summer Camps pilot programme 2015 and 2016, and are we sure and confident that it is money being spent in the right way, the best way? Yes, as outlined, um, the 101 camps cost in and around £1.2 million, uh, but that uh, provided uh, uh, many activities for almost 5,000 young people. Um, so I, I do believe that this uh, does demonstrate value for money at this stage, but our evaluation 
in, in early indications are that the evaluation is very much confirming that. Uh, we understand that the evaluation report was uh, to be finalised at the end of last week. So I understand ministers are looking forward to receiving that probably this week. Uh, but certainly in speaking to officials and speaking to those involved, it, it looks like that evaluation is going to be very, very positive. Call Mr. Daniel Mc Speaker. Following executive agreement, we will publish a new executive child poverty strategy, which will set out our plans to address child poverty. The strategy will be focused on actions to achieve four outcomes. Families, families experience economic well-being, children in poverty learn and achieve, <coughs> children in poverty are healthy, and children in poverty live in safe, secure and stable environments. The strategy will include actions to support young people in rural areas in relation to education, employment, childcare, fuel poverty, financial matters and community development. The Department of Agriculture and Rural Development's Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Framework also sets out plans to specifically address rural poverty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, First Minister, for your question so far. Can I ask that you give your assessment of the need to include child poverty in the new programme for government to ensure that no child in West Throne or any other constituency, for that matter, are disadvantaged by poverty and deprivation? I thank the member uh, for his uh, supplementary question. And indeed, uh, dealing with child poverty will, I'm sure, be one of the outcomes that we will want to uh, have very much in our new programme for government. As he, and I'm sure everyone else by now is aware, because we've been talking about it now for a number of months, we intend to change the focus of the programme for government away from measuring how much we put in and how much money is spent uh, to looking at the outcomes that we can achieve. Uh, and I think that is absolutely the right way uh, to go around that, particularly because if you look at child poverty, it's not just something that sits with OFM, DFM to deal with. It sits right across government. Uh, and whether you're talking about DART and their programmes to deal with it in a rural fashion, or DSD, or the Department of Education, you know, there are so many departments that are involved in dealing with this issue. And therefore, when we move to the new programme for government, we will be looking at the outcomes that we can achieve right across government. Um, can I thank the, the Minister for her answers thus far? And Minister, you did mention the Rural Poverty and Isolation Programme. Can you elaborate and outline how the Child Poverty Strategy uh, will complement and support the actions taken under the uh, Rural Poverty and Isolation Programme and help tackling that? Gormogut. Thank you. And, uh, the uh, Tackling Rural Poverty and Isolation Programme, which sits uh, within the Department of Agriculture has had uh, a positive impact on the lives of rural dwellers, again across a wide range of areas, whether it's rural transport, um, augmenting uh, the work that Daddy has been doing in relation to broadband services by uh, giving more funding to try and deal with it uh, at a rural level, uh, the promotion of good health and positive mental health, fuel poverty, uh, and indeed childcare, rural childcare as well. So all of those actions that have been happening uh, under DARD's Tackling uh, Rural Isolation programme will, we hope, set the base for, for moving forward in dealing with child poverty. I do think it's an integrated approach that we need to adopt in terms of child poverty, and it certainly shouldn't be seen to be the responsibility of the central government department. It should be spread right across government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the First Minister for a very detailed answer so far. But can she inform the House what impact the social investment programme is having specifically in rural areas? And again, this is a, another good example, Mr. Speaker, of how uh, we should complement each other in terms of the policies that have been rolled out from uh, across the different departments. And the social investment fund is certainly helping. Uh, with the issue of child poverty and indeed with poverty uh, in generally across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, 800 people are currently participating in uh, SIF's employment and early intervention projects and uh, by the end of February £61 million had been attributed uh, to projects in SIF so I think that that is a, a very good uh, piece of work given where we were a couple of months ago uh, and indeed we hope that that figure will rise to around £70 million, uh, by the end of the mandate. Uh, particularly in the west of the province, uh, the Work Ready West project, which is a, an employment programme, has employed uh, 120 people in the western zone, put them into 
paid employment. So that's having a real impact uh, on those people and indeed those people's families. And also in the Western Zone, Satchel, uh, which is a project uh, run by uh, Derg Valley Care Services and Bernardo's, uh, is uh, providing early intervention activities for children right across the Western area up to the age of seven. So there have been real and targeted interventions as a result of the work of SIF, and I very much welcome that. Thank you. Mr. Alistair Pat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, does the Minister agree with the Save the Children's? Read on, get on policy assertion that the ability to read well is one of the best routes out of poverty for children? And if so, what actions are being planned to support that policy? Well, I personally um, indicated to Save the Children that I was supportive of that project, and uh, indeed they responded back to me to say that they were very pleased uh, that uh, OFMDFM were expressing uh, our support for that project. And again, it is around early intervention, and whether it's through uh, the nurture units that were set up under uh, delivering social change, or, or whether it was under the uh, uh, project such as Satchel, which is there to provide early intervention, we are trying to raise the standard at a very early stage, so that when people, when young people come into the school environment, that, that they are ready to learn. And so, getting children used to reading, used to books, is a very important piece of that. And I very much support uh, the programme that was set out by Save the Children. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. Peter. We Question number four. Funding has always been an area of considerable challenge, especially in the current economic climate. However, I can assure the member that we remain committed to ensuring that funding goes to deliver the most appropriate level of services to those who need it most. Indeed, victims and survivors remain one of our key priority groups. This has been borne out by the budget allocated to the victim sector from the Northern Ireland Executive since 2011. Since then, the budget has totaled almost £67.5 million, excluding funding from other sources, such as European funding. Over £14 million has been provided to support the victim sector in the current financial year alone, and this includes the highest ever opening budget for the sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Could the uh, First Minister give us an update on the commitments in the Stormont House Agreement and the Fresh Start uh, Agreement in relation to victims and survivors? Well, the Stormont House Agreement uh, includes a number of commitments that relate to victims and survivors. Uh, of course, the Comprehensive Mental Trauma Service. Uh, a victim's pension for severely uh, physically disabled, uh, provision of an advocate counsellor assistance and high quality services, including funding outside uh, of the jurisdiction. And we have made significant progress uh, across those commitments and we're currently giving consideration to how further uh, we can uh, develop those services uh, in the context of a fresh start and understanding that whilst the money uh, in terms of dealing with the past in particular have not yet come to the Northern Ireland Executive, as I've indicated in a, in a previous answer, I do believe that the time is right for the Secretary of State to look at that again and to devolve that money to the Northern Ireland Executive. On a similar theme, Minister, can Minister provide an update on the ongoing collaborative design programme on concerning services for victim survivors? Thank you. Uh, I can indeed, and the collaborative design programme has been progressing. Again, it's about trying to develop an improved uh, model for service delivery, which better meet, meets the needs uh, of all victims and survivors. And uh, back to the question that was asked at, uh, by Mrs. Overin, it's not just about those uh, victims and survivors who find themselves in victims groups. Uh, we have made significant progress uh, in relation to this issue, including improved monitoring and evaluation uh, processes. Uh, and we are running a number of short pilots. Um, uh, in terms of the individual needs programme so that individuals are satisfied and it's not just put through a, a group, not saying that groups are not, uh, uh, of course, uh, something that we intend to work with in the future. Of course they are, and they provide crucial services uh, to many, many victims and survivors across Northern Ireland, but it's not the only way, and we have to understand that in a collaborative design programme that we have to look further than just what has been happening in the past. How can we do it better? For the future.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister, First Minister, for her, her, her responses so far. But does the First Minister believe that it is a, uh, acceptable to essentially uh, park dealing with the past and victims until after the Assembly elections on the 5th of May? And could the First Minister tell us how long victims are going to have to wait? Well, I noted the comments of the member's party leader at the weekend, which of course were ill-informed as to what I'd actually said uh, about dealing with the past. Uh, what I said in relation to dealing with the past is that we as politicians, and it might come as a surprise to some in this House, should be honest uh, with victims and survivors. Do I foresee that people are going to come to an agreement before the Assembly election? No, I don't. And therefore, I think it's incumbent upon me to say that I believe that this matter will not be dealt with before the Assembly election. Does that mean that I wouldn't like to see it dealt with before the Assembly election? Of course, I would have liked to have seen it dealt with last November. Last November, I would have liked to have seen it dealt with. So, really, if the, uh, I know it was all very exciting at the weekend at the party conference uh, at the Le Mans, but people should get their facts right before they start making allegations. I call Mr Alistair. Uh, this Friday is European Day of Victims of Terrorism, an event which will be marked again next Monday in the Senate Chamber. Does the First Minister accept that it's a badge of dishonour and shame on her administration and these institutions that the definition of victim, which shapes who can get funding, continues to include victim makers? And can she tell us, in consequence of that definition, the member will how many resume. victim the makers member will his seat. How many victim makers have received Please funding, speak including prisoners? Resume group. your seat. Uh, Minister, one question at a time, and I've made it clear that uh, I would expect ministers as well to kind of uh, remember that. Well, first of all, no prisoners' groups have had victims' funding. That's the first thing to say to that. The second thing, of course, to say in relation to the question that was asked was that it was my party who tried to change the definition of a victim. It is uh, this party that wants to do that. Unfortunately, there are others in this House that do not want to see that happening. We will continue to try and bring forward legislation in the next mandate to try and deal with that matter, but we need others to join with us to do that. And that, that is the reality. And of course, uh, the victim's definition was set before devolution. Uh, of course, uh, that's something that Mr Alistair conveniently doesn't tell people. And we have to deal with that reality. I'm dealing with realities and I'm not dealing with fantasy politics. And I do want to take this opportunity, when he has made reference to European Victims' Day, to say how much I utterly condemn the attack on the prison officer last weekend. It was a, a despicable murder attempt and thankfully did not succeed. But as the Secretary of State has said, uh, we have to be lucky all of the time. The bad guys only have to be lucky once. And so I do call upon, particularly given the activities in Carnfunnock as well, in Larne at the weekend, I do call upon the public to be vigilant. I, I do praise the member of the public who brought um, the arms cash uh, to the attention of the police service of Northern Ireland. And we must, we must make sure that the entire public gives their support to the police service of Northern Ireland so that we can bring these people to justice and make sure that Northern Ireland continues on a positive and productive journey to the future. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Pingeli to answer this question. Together, building a united community reflects the Executive's commitment to improving community relations and continuing the journey towards a more united and shared society. The strategy outlines how government, community and individuals will work together to build a united community and achieve change against the following key priorities. Our children and young people, our shared community, our safe community and our cultural expression. The Good Relations Indicators will monitor the Executive's progress on delivery against each of the four key priorities. 
Can I also say how particularly pleased I am that we have produced an ambitious and robust good relations strategy, something that previous administrations and parties had failed to achieve. I think it is an excellent example of the strong leadership being shown to build a better future for Northern Ireland. Can I thank the junior minister for her answer? Uh, junior minister, can I ask you what the funding arrangements are for the TBUC for 2016-17? At this stage, we have been working very closely with a range of departments to assess what the funding requirements would be. Uh, together, Building United Community, like uh, some of the other OFM, DFM projects, such as Delivering Social Change, has particular challenges in that we have uh, delivery partners, our SRO, single responsible owners, appointed uh, in terms of each of the departments. So that requires, in terms of the one agenda, to go out, to talk to a range of those departments, assess what their spending plans are, and to assess at what stage they are in terms of the design and rollout of their particular projects. We have been undertaking that process for some time. We have secured funds uh, for Together by the United Community rolling forward into next year, but we will want to place this strategy onto a robust footing, so therefore we will continue that work and we anticipate that there will be changes and increased demand as those final projects uh, are rolled out. And I call Mr Roy Bay. We have not yet received correspondence from the Minister of Education relating to the exception of teachers from fair employment provisions as contained in Article 71 of the Fair Employment and Treatment Northern Ireland Order 1998. I understand that the Minister of Education wrote to the Speaker's office in February 2015 on the matter and stated that he did not believe that there was a need to continue with the exception and that it was a matter for OFMDFM to take forward. Our Department's position was that although we are responsible for the Fair Employment and Treatment Northern Ireland Order 1998, the issue clearly impacts on the Department of Education. Therefore, we are currently working with the Department of Education to consider the matter further. The, the parties that the First Minister and Deputy First, First Minister represent have individually said that they are in favour of removal of this exception, which permits unfair treatment. Can the First Minister, as of yet, commit and advise what proactive action the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, acting together, have taken to remove this exception? Well, for me, I have to say, Mr Speaker, this is an equality issue. And uh, I was somewhat surprised to see that the petition of concern was used by Sinn Féin and the SDLP uh, to block an amendment uh, just last week. Uh, this is a 35-year-old uh, exemption, and the Equality Commission last reviewed it in 2004. I was somewhat surprised when I checked that that was the case, because, of course, the Equality Commission of Northern Ireland has a duty to review uh, this, this exemption, and hasn't done so for now coming on 12 years. Uh, so I think it's long past the time yeah. when the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland reviewed this matter again. Uh, and brought forward proposals to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. <coughs> okay, and we move on then, and I call Ms. Rosalind McCorley. Question seven. The delivery of the three delivering social change signature programmes announced in September 2014 and being jointly funded with Atlantic Philanthropies is progressing well. These three cross-cutting programmes have placed an increased focus in the areas of the early intervention transformation, dementia services and shared education. The total estimated costs associated with the programmes is some £56.3 million. Atlantic Philanthropies have committed to fund 40% of the total estimated cost, that's £22.5 million, and the remaining 60% will be funded through central funds and lead departments, that is £22.5 million and £11.23 million, respectively. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And, and could I ask the Minister if she could give me some more information, please, on, in respect of the 14 individual projects under uh, the EITP? Yeah, the focus for the early intervention programme will be on delivering systematic change in how mainstream services to children and families are delivered. 
with the anticipation that different approaches at an earlier stage will measurably improve outcomes from children over the long term, many of whom are, are most vulnerable. And recently, when I was in Harpers Hill uh, Family and Children's Centre in Coleraine, uh, they were able to tell me that intervention that had taken place at a very early stage had meant that children then didn't come in to their notice uh, later on. And it was Yes, it was a long period of time to wait for an outcome, but it was an outcome worth waiting on. And sometimes I think in government we like to see targets met uh, year on year, but sometimes it takes 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years to see the outcome of early intervention. Uh, uh, but I think it really is a key part, and I hope will be a key part, of our programme for government rolling forward into the next mandate. And that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. I'm sorry. Um, we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we all support the PSNI and others uh, for their efforts against terrorists. Uh, I ask what assurances will the First Minister give that action by the security forces will be swiftly implemented to thwart terrorist activity, which is putting lives at risk? Yes, and I think we were all very concerned to hear the assessment from the Assistant Chief Constable on Friday uh, in and around dissident <coughs> Republicans and the fact that they were going to use Easter 1916 as an excuse, if you like, uh, to perpetrate their violence and their mayhem and the, their agents of death. So I do absolutely believe that we as politicians need to give very strong uh, leadership we need to say that it is entirely unacceptable and rejected. But more than that, we have to support the police service of Northern Ireland so that they can bring these people to justice. And that's why, whilst the find at Larne was very disturbing, I think the fact that we were able to find it is a good, is a good news message. Nori for supplement. I do thank the First Minister for her answer. And I would ask her, does she consider it premature to upgrade border patrols uh, and the rounding up of terrorist suspects? Well, I would hope that uh, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, if they're aware uh, of anyone who has a case to answer, then they should very much uh, deal with that issue. Uh, I was asked this question on Friday, and of course, uh, my answer then and my answer now uh, with respect to you is that that is a matter for the Chief Constable and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. They are in operational control, if you like. It would be wrong. Uh, for a politician to direct them as to how to do their job. All we can do is to give leadership and to give support to him in whatever he decides he needs uh, in terms of resources, and certainly he'll not find me wanting in that respect. And call Mr. Michael uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister what steps does she reasonably believe uh, the Northern Ireland Executive can take in the event of a yes vote uh, through uh, the European referendum and the United Kingdom leaving Europe? Of course, uh, whether there is a yes vote on the 24th of June or not is entirely a matter for the people of Northern Ireland. It's not a matter for political parties. It is a referendum. It is not an election. And therefore, each individual will make their assessment as to whether they believe we are right uh, to remain within the European Union or whether we should leave. Uh, for my part, uh, I believe that the United Kingdom uh, should establish its sovereignty again, and that is in terms uh, particularly of our economic sovereignty. And uh, I understand that his party has taken a different view. But you know what? It is a matter for the people of Northern Ireland and the whole of the United Kingdom, and we look forward to that referendum. But let me say this, Mr. Speaker, we should not take our eye off the ball that there's a very important election uh, before then, and there are matters to be dealt with on a Northern Ireland basis before that referendum comes. Thank you, Mr. McGimsey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And bearing in mind, yes, the election will be very much fought on issues around health spiralling waiting lists uh, on employment and investment in education. Uh, but does the First Minister believe that in the event of a, of a Brexit that the 25 per cent of our exports that currently go to the Irish Republic will continue? Uh, or does she believe there is a threat there? And what steps does she believe we can reasonably take to protect that export trade? 
Well, of course, we trade with very many uh, nations right across uh, the globe. It's not just our trade with the Republic of Ireland that we need to concentrate on. Uh, I know perhaps more than most in this House that our new and emerging markets are hugely important as well, particularly the Far East and the Middle East, never mind uh, the Americas. So uh, it is difficult uh, to assess just uh, what difference that would make in terms of if we are in the European Union or if we are not. But people will make their own assessment and they will make that judgment. Can I say in relation to his comment? in relation to health and education. I'm delighted that my colleague, uh, the Minister for Health, has made available uh, £30,000 more to deal with health uh, waiting lists. In fact, that adds to £40,000, which was allocated uh, in the monitoring. £30 million, £30 million, £30,000, £30 million, uh, which is added to the £40 million um, to deal with uh, health waiting lists that were, was allocated to him uh, in the last monitoring round. So that's £70 million pounds to deal with waiting lists. And right so, because I think we have all uh, noticed that there has been difficulties in relation to this issue, and I'm just glad that he's listening to that and has been able to allocate that money. Thirty uh, can, can I ask the Minister, as her department takes the lead on equality matters, what plans do you have for bringing forward an action plan to address the differences in the pay of males, male and female employees? Well, of course, uh, we have many strategies within OFM, DFM. We have uh, the gender equality strategy, which in, is in development and is in early draft stage, and we hope uh, that that new strategy will be published in late 2016. Uh, it's uh, very important that the member should raise uh, that issue uh, this week because, of course, Mr Speaker, we do recognise that you have allocated this as a, a week where we should be aware of all of these issues surrounding women's issues, and we thank you for raising that. Uh, and uh, Tomorrow is International Women's Day, and we look forward to all our male colleagues celebrating that with us. Ms Bronwyn McGowan. I, I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask the Minister, um, in, in its planning in relation to this very important matter, has the Minister's Department given consideration to the Employment Bill, which is currently making its way through this House, which actually there was an amendment passed regarding uh, the gender pay gap and disclosure of information? Well, of course, this is a, a very complex issue, and I know uh, our executive colleague, the Dell Minister, is taking this matter forward. Uh, there are, of course, part-time working issues to take into account, caring duties, uh, and those are all part of the gender equality strategy that we hope to uh, bring out towards the end uh, of this year. Uh, just to uh, make sure that my male colleagues don't feel left out, International Men's Day is on the 19th of November. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, before I, I ask my question, can I thank the First Minister for that information and her support around International Women's Day? Um, I want to ask her a question on numeracy and literacy. And we know that the numeracy and literacy, literacy scheme is supporting over 18,000 children. Um, does she support the mainstreaming of this fund? Well, of course, uh, I, when I came into OFM, DFM, obviously I had a look at all of the different strategies and the different interventions that we were involved with. And I've had the opportunity to visit uh, a number of schools and to hear their feedback uh, on a one-to-one -one basis around uh, some of the interventions that we've made. And this has been uh, one of those interventions that has been hugely appreciated, uh, not just by the teachers, but I think by families right across Northern Ireland. And I do hope, and of course it is a matter uh, for the Minister of Education, that it can still continue because I think it's making a real difference to families right across Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the First Minister for her answer? As someone who is a, a representative of North Belfast and knows only too well uh, the, the issues around numeracy and literacy, can I uh, go on to ask the First Minister, is she optimistic that this will be funded through the Department of Education? Well, I thought it answered that question, but I'll try again. Uh, of course, it is a matter for the Minister of Education. I would hope that uh, he will uh, find the resources to do that, and, uh, because I think it's making a real difference. And uh, Being able to help young people is the most satisfying thing I think that any of us as politicians can hope to do, to inspire them, to motivate them, and to encourage them, uh, and that's certainly something we should look to do. Call Mr. Danny Kennett. 
Mr. Speaker. First Minister will be aware uh, of the excellent work undertaken by the County Armagh Development Association, based in my constituency uh, and working throughout County Armagh. Uh, will she undertake to uh, consult with her executive colleagues in DSD and DARD to ensure that this organisation is properly and fully funded in the new financial year? Yes, I am aware of that organisation and similar organisations uh, right across Northern Ireland. I would hope, uh, again, that funding is found so that those uh, people who are providing a really good service, particularly in rural areas of, of Northern Ireland, uh, will be able to continue. It's something that has been raised with me directly by my colleague, the Chairman of the Agriculture Committee, uh, Mr William Irwin, and I intend to take that forward. Mr. Kennedy, for thank the uh, First Minister for her, for her response thus far. Uh, will she uh, use her, her, her considerable influence to ensure that County Armagh Development Association will be informed at the earliest opportunity uh, about their funding allocations uh, in order to create maximum certainty uh, both to their employees and to their user groups? And I understand there are two issues here. Um, there is the PUL issue in terms of funding for the work that has been going on uh, in terms of that programme, and then there is a cut, I think, also in terms of uh, wider uh, facilities and services that have been given. Uh, I do support the member in saying that we need to give clarity as quickly as possible. I think that is absolutely right, as I understand that uh, this is to come to a head at the end of this month, uh, and therefore we need to deal with the matter quickly, and he has my assurance that I will deal with it swiftly. And I uh, just inform the House that uh, question six has been withdrawn within the appropriate time frame. So I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the First Minister outline what um, message she intends to take to the United States when she visits um, next week um, around the reduced level of corporation tax here in Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his question. We have a very good story to tell in relation to our work uh, with the United States and the companies. Actually, just last week, uh, separately, the Deputy First Minister and myself met with Drew O'Brien, who was sent here uh, by Minister Kerry in terms of economic uh, uh, envoy. And he brought with him some people from universities, from businesses, and we were very pleased to meet with him because we want to have more people like that come to visit us here in Northern Ireland. Because um, I haven't had an opportunity to speak to the Deputy First Minister about this yet, but I found that they were enthused by what they found here uh, in Londonderry and in Belfast, uh, and hopefully they can now act as agents for us out in the United States. So it's one thing. Uh, for us to go out and talk about all that is good about Northern Ireland, including the lowering of corporation tax, but it's also very good to have advocates uh, in the United States as well talking about Northern Ireland. For a supplement. Thank you, and I commend the First Minister for all the work she's done in respect of the corporation tax issue. But um, given the um, in fact, she's going out to the United States. Will she take the opportunity to invite both businesses and people um, in the United States to come over to Northern Ireland to see exactly the, the product that we have here in Northern Ireland and indeed its people? So the, there's a couple of messages there. Certainly, I would invite people to come to Northern Ireland because once they come, uh, it overcomes some of the perceptions that have grown up over many years about this place as a place to do business in. But as well as that, we want to invite them to come here from a tourism perspective uh, as well. Uh, we'll certainly be doing that. I have found once people actually come to Northern Ireland, they are enthusiastic about the place. So certainly my key message will be to try and invite as many people as possible to come and visit us here, but also to tell them why, and that's of course around our proposition of uh, good young people who are very willing to work, have a very high skill base, good education, and indeed the cost of accommodation is considerably lower than elsewhere uh, in the United Kingdom and indeed on this island as well. So we have a very good proposition as well as the new tool of a lower rate of corporation tax. So I'm very confident about the visit when it happens next week. And I call Mr Adrian Cochran Watson. And can I warn that there may not be time for a supplementary? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure First Minister you join with me in congratulating Lion Air in announcing the new routes last week from Belfast International Airport. Can you outline is there uh, any progress could be made 
towards the abolition of air passenger duty, which is harbouring Gulf at Belfast International and the city airport. Well, as the member is aware, uh, the uh, air passenger duty issue is a matter for Westminster. We have long called uh, at a United Kingdom level for the air passenger duty rate to be abolished in terms of uh, domestic flights. As he is already aware, uh, air passenger duty in respect of international flights, such as the New York flight, uh, has already been abolished, um, and that cost the executive a, a considerable amount of money to be able to do that. If we were to do the same and not have it on a UK-wide basis, it would again cost the block grant a considerable amount of money. But I believe there's much more that the airports can do to help themselves. I believe there's much more we can do to help them through air route development. And I'm sure if he puts a question to the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment, he'll be able to update them in relation to that matter. Thank you very much. And we now 